Welcome back to PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy, and today is Valentine's Day, and I just thought it would be just so nice to share with you the wonderful snow that is falling outside. I just came in with my two kids and we had an awesome morning sledding. And thankfully uh, we stayed out of the patio. And uh, now I just wanna share with you how to recover a patient post a TAVR procedure. A lot of you may be wondering, what is a TAVR? Well, it stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And it is when an interventional cardiologist um, accesses the femoral artery to then tunnel catheters up into the aorta and then in through the aortic valve to deploy an aortic valve um, prosthetic replacement to um, treat the stenosed native aortic valve. And this is done for severe aortic stenosis. With severe aortic stenosis comes decreased cardiac output because the left ventricle has to pump against that calcified aortic valve and uh, it's, a, it's adding to higher and higher pressures and, and poor outflow, which then compromises and drops your cardiac output. This can cause lightheadedness. It can cause syncope, um, dizzy episodes, loss of consciousness, and then the patients usually experience congestive heart failure symptoms, even at rest. So the blood is backing up from the left ventricle and backing up into a pulmonary vasculature, causing that CHF. This can cause chest pain and chest tightness. It can cause shortness of breath with activity or at rest. And as it gets more and more severe, the symptoms worsen so that it's not related to just with activity. Patients begin to feel this even at rest. How do you treat aortic stenosis? Well, there are two means to treating and managing aortic stenosis. You can either go one, the surgical route, or you could go the transcatheter route. So the most traditional way that we have seen over medicine for over all the years is a SAVR which is a surgical aortic valve replacement. And this is an open chest um, surgical approach, a sternotomy. And um, it's usually done when the patient has not just single valve disease, but usually aortic and mitral valve disease, or if they have multivessel coronary artery disease requiring a bypass, they could do it uh, in conjunction with that bypass. And if they have anatomical variances, bicuspid valves instead of tricuspid valves that would contraindicate you from doing the transcutaneous approach. With the surgical approach, it's a longer recovery. Um, the patient, like I said, has a sternotomy, um, will be recovered in the ICU, will have chest tubes. Yes, it's a much more extensive recovery than going transcatheter approach. Um, patients who cannot do blood thinners long-term will need to do the surgical approach for aortic valve replacement because if you receive animal valve as opposed to a mechanical valve, which would require long-term anticoagulation coverage. The TAVR, this is less invasive. It's um, going in through the vasculature, the femoral artery and the femoral vein. And it's usually done in the cath lab or a hybrid room that has endovascular access, fluoro, um, 3D imaging, the femoral artery is accessed and a large bore sheath is placed and catheter is advanced up that sheath into the um, aorta. And then the catheter will be advanced across the aortic valve. And at that point, they will angioplasty the stenosed native aortic valve, opening it up because remember it's tight and it's calcified. So they want to open that up. Uh, when they do this angioplasty, your patient is at risk for a stroke at this point because they could break off some calcium. Uh, usually they will go up into the carotids and deploy some umbrellas to catch any um, calcification that may get released with that angioplasty to prevent embolic strokes. Um, so once they get the balloon across the aortic valve, they inflate it and blow it up and do the angioplasty to that native valve. 
then they will take the balloon out and then they will thread up the mechanical valve, the new aortic valve, um, and they will deploy it and it will have little hooks on its edges and it will hook into the wall of the native aortic valve. Now, the location of deployment is critical. Uh, they usually do CAT scans and they measure everything so that they are deploying the proper device, the proper size, because every patient is different. Um, and then they will um, then come back out and then make sure as soon as the valve is deployed, it's immediately functioned. And they are looking to make sure that there's no leak around the valve. They're making sure that the valve is in proper placement. Uh, they're also looking to see if there's any arrhythmias that occur with deploying the valve. With the aortic valve deployment, it can have influences on the conduction system. Our conduction system of our heart, the AV node, the pacemaker of the heart, well, that is in the right atrium. And then it goes down to the bundles of Hiss and there is the, um, the septum. And there is a section of the septum that involves those bundles um, where they branch off into the right and left ventricle. And that is where the close proximity of the aortic valve comes into place. And sometimes with the deployment, there can be um, influence of uh, a conduction delay uh, in that region. And so the number one delay that you will, or the number one arrhythmia that you will see is a new left bundle branch block. And this is important post-op to assess for. Uh, you'll be doing a 12 lead immediately to look at that because you want to make sure that the heart is synchronous, the right and left ventricle are synchronous with each other. Um, and so that is one of the things that you'll be looking at post-op when you do that 12 lead immediately. Another conduction occurrence is first degree block. Patients may actually develop a new first degree block or even a, a winky block. And if this does occur, then the patient will probably end up getting a permanent pacemaker. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. We could talk a lot more about this conduction. Um, delays with TAVRs, um, but they're looking at trying to identify the higher risk patients pre-op before they even have their TAVR to avoid complications post-op or anticipating it and maybe placing a leadless pacemaker um, in conjunction with the TAVR. Some of you who are familiar with the cath lab, this is what one of those endovascular um, interventional cath lab suites look like. Uh, there's usually a bank of screens for the interventionalist to be watching as they are working. And um, anesthesia will be up by the airway. Yes, it's a very technical room. You get report from your lab that they are coming with the post taver patient. You're gonna get your 12 lead ready by the bedside. You're gonna make sure that you have all your basic things, your ox oxygen, your suction ready, your computer ready, your report, you've looked it up, you know their history, um, you've looked at the anesthesia record and they roll out from um, the OR and now they're in PACU. You are going to do all the things that you normally do with your immediate post-op assessment, but you're gonna add a couple extra things there. First thing is you're gonna be looking at that rhythm. Um, are they in a new heart block? Are they in a sinus Brady or is it a first degree AV block? Um, those are the things that you need to identify immediately. Do they have a new left bundle branch block? So you're gonna be doing that 12 lead immediately post-op and um, reviewing that and comparing that to their pre-op 12 lead and having a conversation with anesthesia about that. Many of the TAVRs that I have recovered are usually bradycardiac in the 50s. Many of the times we just watch it as long as they are asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic, then anesthesia um, will usually begin to treat that. Some patients do get a pacemaker placed with their TAVR. That can occur because remember I was telling you about the conduction pathway and its proximity to the TAVR. So um, those are just conversations you'll receive in report if they have a new like leadless placemaker that was placed during the procedure and why it was placed. Now we are going to do everything to minimize the bleeding. So the patients have had large catheters placed in their femoral arteries and veins. And so they've had a lot of anticoagulation, a lot of heparin. And what we wanna do is minimize any bleeding um, at those sites. So they're on bed rest and then 
you want to make sure that they do not lift their head up off the bed, anything that's going to add pressure to their core. So no coughing, no laughing, no sneezing. If they have to do any of those things, you're going to be putting pressure on their groin to minimize any bleeding or popping of any of those vascular devices. If in a rare chance any of that happens, you immediately hold pressure for 15 minutes without looking, restart your hemostasis time from the time that you achieve hemostasis again. Um, you're also going to be doing um, a neuro assessment post-op because these patients are at risk for an embolic event. They now have a mechanical valve in uh, into their old native calcified valve. So you want to um, identify if there's any early signs of a stroke and report that to your um, interventional cardiologist because they will definitely absolutely want to work them up um, for any stroke-like symptoms. Follow your bed rest orders from your physician. It was manual closure at six hours. Some of the regular closure devices decrease the bed rest from six hours to three hours. So follow um, your physician's orders or the manufacturer's guidelines for that. Then you also wanna maintain pain management. A lot of these patients don't have the best backs and laying on a flat stretcher, a hard stretcher, the OR table, um, they wake up and they have discomfort that's usually spinal orthopedic. So just make sure that you are addressing those needs to keep them comfortable. Also maintaining um, a normal blood pressure. You don't want them too hypertensive. This can cause to a stroke or bleeding. Um, so you're gonna maintain blood pressure control. And then they may have Plavix ordered post-op if they haven't already received it. So you definitely wanna have those conversations at report because it's imperative that they get it in their system because they now have a mechanical valve that we'll need anticoagulation for. Then once the patient goes to phase two recovery and all of our TAVRs went to our neurovascular step-down floor, not to ICU unless we had complications. So just find out where the flow is in your facility for where these patients go next. But the biggest thing is gonna be the continued bleeding precautions. Um, so the bed rest, um, no crossing their legs, no bending their knees. If they have to laugh, cough or sneeze, again, giving support to the groin so that you don't pop any of those um, closure devices. And then also teaching the patient how to put support on their groin themselves if they feel like they um, need to cough or maybe um, they're gonna be at home and they need to bear down to have a bowel movement, which we really don't want them bearing down at all. So they need to be taking stool softeners. But it's really important to do that teaching because I have seen um, an angio seal pop three days after and then the patient developed um, a hematoma there and it turned into a pseudo aneurysm. Um, of the femoral artery. And so it's really important that you teach them to put pressure there. And if they do have any bleeding when they're at home to not let go of the pressure and just to call 911 um, and to stay calm um, so that we can keep the blood pressure down and minimize the bleeding at that site and get it under control. So that teaching is really imperative um, at the phase two level and then even at the discharge home level. During the phase two recovery, after a TAVR, it's really important to teach your patients about infection prevention um, because now they have a mechanical valve and they are going to need lifelong prophylaxis to avoid any growths on that valve as they have dental work done or maybe they have a future surgery, like maybe they have to have um, a knee replacement, etc. They need to be very conscious and aware to know that they need antibiotic coverage before those procedures uh, signs of infection are fever, chills, malaise, um, just not feeling right. If they have any of these symptoms, they need to call their doctor right away and get in and get seen and get blood cultures taken and then also have their valve looked at either through a TEE, which is the gold standard, or a 2DFL. So you want to teach your patient and their family the FAST acronym, which is the facial drooping, the arm weakness, the speech difficulty, the slurring of the words, or the making no sense of the words, and then remember time to call 911. So before the patients are discharged, they will have an echo done the next day to assess the function of the valve.
For bathing, um, you're going to avoid tub bathing until their groin access sites are completely he healed. Um, they can do um, a shower, just avoid spray on those areas. And then no heavy lifting, nothing more than a gallon of milk. They can ask their family and friends to help them lift things. And that's just to make sure that you don't have any bleeding problems at those groin sites um, as they heal up. And then they should take their pain medications as prescribed as needed. And then if they are taking pain medications, they can, should continue the stool softeners so that they don't get constipation. I say two days, you don't have a bowel movement, go right to a fleet's enema. Uh, don't waste your time. We don't want these patients bearing down and then having a bleeding complication later at home. Trivia time. How common is severe aortic stenosis? How many heart valve surgeries are done in the United States annually? Well, the answer is one in eight Americans have severe aortic disease. And we do a roughly 182,000 um, aortic valve replacements annually in the United States. So if you're not doing this at your hospital, I'm pretty sure there's a hospital in your region that is doing it and um, has become the leader in this. And so I hope this helps to grow your practice and help you better care for your patients after a TAVR. Here are my references. I hope that this uh, brings value added to your practice and please share this with your UPC committee groups. And thank you as always for tuning into PACU Nursing Minutes. I am Nurse Kathy. Happy Valentine's Day. May you all have a wonderful day and protect those vows.